Good afternoon, everybody. It's Philip Lovejoy, the Executive Director of the Harvard Alumni Association. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today for this great talk. Please do note, that as you heard on your way in, that this program is being recorded. If you wish to ensure your voice or likeness isn't captured, please turn off your video and mute your audio. Otherwise, we encourage you to have your cameras on, but remain muted until the Q&A session. So I am joining you once again from New Hampshire. Our speaker, Phil Deloria, is joining from Michigan. And I happen to know we have people on here from Birmingham, Atlanta, Chicago, California. So welcome, everybody. It's really great uh, to be together for this talk. I'm delighted to welcome and introduce Philip Deloria, professor of history at Harvard University. This is the Philip and Philip show, which has been driving Heather crazy and trying to organize it. Um, but it's going to be a lot of fun. Phil's a relatively new member of the Harvard community, having been named the first tenured professor of Native American history just two years ago. But he's already deeply committed to the Harvard alumni community. And this spring, before we were upended by COVID, he was meant to address our spring board meeting. And he was also a hit plan to travel alongside alumni through the travel program. So Phil, thank you for your connection and commitment to the alumni community and for joining us today. I encourage you to read Phil's full biography on his faculty page. As you learn about today, his scholarship and his life are extraordinary. It's my pleasure to welcome a filmmaker, a musician, and esteemed historian, Phil Deloria, to talk with us about storytelling in an American Indian family. And without further ado, please welcome Phil to the virtual stage. Thanks so much. Uh, so um, I am so happy to be here. Uh, and thanks for calling us all together um, today. Thanks to the members of the Harvard Alumni Association who are joining us uh, for today's session. And I wanna particularly sort of shout out any members who had signed up for our June trip across the Northern Plains down to the Four Corners region. Um, you know, we've got some dates for next year and let's cross our fingers and uh, you know, hope that we'll see each other um, you know, next year. Second, uh, I wanna acknowledge that, um, that while we are spread across the country um, and perhaps even the globe, the institution that binds us together, Harvard University, um, sits on the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people. The Charter of 1650, which promises to educate uh, English and Indian youth and the public provisions surrounding Harvard in the, in the Constitution of the Massachusetts Commonwealth also demands that we recognize our relationship as an institution to Wampanoag, Nipmuc, and others of native New England uh, and beyond. And third, uh, I've been on leave this year, so I have not had the pleasure of Zoom teaching and thus have not become an expert on Zoom. I'll be working on that over the summer for my courses for the fall, um, just in case. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna thank you in advance for uh, your patience with any Zoom mishaps um, that may lie ahead. So, storytelling in an American Indian family. Today, I wanna to walk you through a bunch of stories. Uh, some are short, some are a bit longer, uh, dealing with members of my family. Some of these are gonna feel like traditional stories. They'll have beginnings, middles, and ends, uh, causes and consequences, uh, morals and lessons. Others may be a little bit more like strings of details um, with less narrative structure. Um, I'm hoping that they all add up to a somewhat larger question that I hope you'll ponder with me over the next 40 minutes. It's a question I don't have an answer to. Um, those are good questions for historians. And the question is this, how do you make sense of a, of a body uh, of family stories, right? As a historian, how might you explain not an individual person acting in relation to the circumstances of their moment, or explain a group of people acting collectively, right, in one of those similar shared historical moments, but how do you explain a kind of multi-generational narrative that includes a diverse array of people spread across time, and in this case, time that extends from the late 18th century all the way to the early 21st century, right? Can a genealogy be coherent um, and is this one. So with that, let me share my screen and show you uh, a bit of a genealogy. It's gonna actually structure what we do here today. Um, I, I put this up here in part because I do wanna pitch my new book, Becoming Mary Sully, which makes a great holiday gift. And I think it's actually, I'll say this, this is the best uh, intellectual academic project I've ever been involved with. And um, I'll be circling back um, around, around to it. Uh, there we go. So here's the, here's the genealogy in question. Um, and I could have put more people on this, but uh, we only have 40 some minutes. Uh, and uh, it, there's a lot of folks on here um, already. It stretches across four different uh, generations. And I'll just sort of quickly map them for you in a slightly different way. 
here's some of the sort of, uh, sort of main women, starting in the upper right-hand corner, my mom, Barbara Deloria, my grandmother, Barbara Deloria. I could also tell you my aunt, Barbara Deloria, and my cousin, Barbara Deloria. We have, tend to have a lot of people in the family named Barbara. Uh, my great-grandmother, Mary Sully Deloria, Akichitawin, soldier woman in Lakota or Dakota, and then Pehan Lutawin or Pehan Dutawin, red crane woman, my great-great-grandmother. And then if we were to take the men on the, their side of the family, my, again, up in the upper right-hand corner, my father, Vine Deloria Jr., grandfather, Vine Sr., uh, my great-grandfather, Philip J. Deloria, who's the person I'm named for, and then Sasue or Francois Deloria, uh, my great-great-grandfather. Sasue, uh, just to tell you a very tiny little story, um, we spent a long time trying to figure out what Sasue meant. It doesn't actually seem to translate much uh, in the Dakota language, but um, we pretty much, my dad and I concluded, that it's just Lakota, Dakota people trying to say Francois Deloria uh, and Sasue, and you can kind of hear it, it sort of sounds, uh, you know, a little bit, uh, little bit the same. I'm going to add in two unmarried uh, women of my grandfather's generation, my two great aunts, Ella Cara Deloria and Susan Mabel Deloria. So I want to start with my dad um, and think a little bit about him and then work backwards. So my dad, Vine Deloria, um, Vine Deloria Jr. In 1969, my dad published this book, Custer Died for Your Sins. We've been celebrating over the last year its 50th anniversary and I've had cause to go back and read that, sort of think a bit more about, uh, about his life and his career. 69 was a, a big year for Indian people, right? Uh, it's the year that Scott Mamaday won the Pulitzer Prize for Housemaid of Dawn. Uh, it's also in November of that year um, when Indians of all tribes took over the Alcatraz prison uh, near San Francisco. Uh, only a few years later, Native people would take over the church at Wounded Knee on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, uh, in between there, there was a march on Washington. There was a whole series of other kinds of things. So Native people in that period of time were incredibly visible and active um, in ways that have had consequence ever since. But I also want to sort of think about the ways my dad, um, you know, lived within a cosmopolitan kind of circle. And one of the fun ways uh, to do that is to look at the cover of his second book, We Talk, You Listen, and to link it up to the design work that was going on in New York City by Milton Glaser, uh, and in this case, Jason McWhorter, who did the design. This was the Pushpin Studios in New York, a really interesting and fabulous design studio. I say this to anyone who has got a GSD connection out there, including my wife who's online um, with us today. Um, but it's not just that. My dad became completely obsessed with this literary scene at this New York bar called the, the Lion's Head. The first night he was there, he wandered in, and Pete Hamill and Gloria Steinem bought him dinner. He went out, hung out with the poet Joel Oppenheimer, um, David Markson, other people. Um, so I'm not going to read this, just giving you a sort of sense of some of the things. So my dad, native guy from South Dakota, loved the New York literary scene um, and loved to think about the ways in which he was involved with that, uh, with that literary scene. And why is my slide not advancing? There we go. Okay, so this is this sort of moment, right, where Native activists are out in the street, they're taking over things, they are making demands and proclamations. Um, what my dad did uh, in this context, uh, I think two things that are really important. First of all, he really did try to establish a kind of political and legal and philosophical position um, for Native people. Um, here you can see him sort of suggesting that uh, those uh, uh, laws that had come out of the 1930s, reforms of the 1930s, the Indian Reorganization Act being the Kind of linchpin of that was 40 years old at that time, right? And that we needed to think about the world of space age Indians, right? So he's not afraid of modernity, completely engaged with all kinds of issues and questions. The other thing he tried to do was to get non-native people to think harder about the ways that they thought about Indian people, and particularly around the question of race, which was so salient in the 1960s. Um, but I find myself doing some writing these days among very, very similar lines, and it's interesting to note the ways that conversations about race in America really fall back into a black-white binary. I see this, for example, with my very, very smart grad students, and I keep asking them, why are we doing this? Isn't race more complicated than that? So my dad was asking people back in 1969 to think a bit about those kinds of things as well. The result of this was I put up nine book covers, but he actually did more writing. This is just in a 10-year period from 1969 to 1979. He'd go on to write 30 books, over, more than 30 books over the course of his career. And these books all dabble in all kinds of things, theology, law, uh, they engage the churches, they seek to construct a master narrative, and they lay out a political and philosoph uh, philosophical kind of position for Native people moving forward. So he's this quite important person when we think about Native 
intellectual history. Now, if we imagine sort of thinking about how he's connected up with his genealogy, with this, this, his ancestors, we might go back, um, and I'm gonna try to touch on every one of these people, at least briefly, to this pairing, Alfred Sully uh, and Pehan Dutuland. So Alfred Sully was a military officer. Um, he was active in the Mexican-American War, fought during the Civil War, and then was sent out in the 1860s uh, to fight with Lakota and Dakota people following the Minnesota uprisings. And he was also an artist, and he came by his art in an interestingly genealogical kind of way. His father was Thomas Sully, who you may or may not have heard of, but you will recognize his work. He was the foremost portrait painter, or one of them, um, in the antebellum period of American history. He painted all kinds of American celebrities, uh, including this very familiar Andrew Jackson, which you probably will recognize from the $20 bill. So Thomas Sully, an interesting guy. For those who engaged with Boston in the MFA, you'll note that in the Art of the Americas uh, wing, uh, this installation of his massive version of Washington crossing the Delaware. They built a special wall for this incredibly large painting. If you're at the MFA, it's always worth taking a look. It's a kind of anchor painting for the collection. Well, in April 1857, Alfred Sully sent a box back to Philadelphia to his father that contained one pair of moccasins uh, and these three paintings. And I have only the black, black and white version is a, is a study print of a painting that is in a private collection, but the other two are in public collections. Here they are, these paintings. And what's interesting and important is that there are two women who are pictured in each of them. If you look in the black and white version, off to the left, these two women are standing together. If you look in the upper right, you can see them standing together again. And if you look at this bottom one, this kind of romantic version of our vision of uh, Dakota Indian maidens, there they are kind of posed outside of a, of a teepee camp. Well, one of these women was my great-great-grandmother, Pehan Dutawin, Pehan Lutawin, um, red crane woman. And the moccasins in the box had come from her. She'd made these moccasins. Now, in Dakota tradition, one of the things that can happen is a woman who has a sort of crush maybe on a, a man might prepare a gift for him. There's some speculation that perhaps these moccasins, which he said were given to him by the two young ladies, um, uh, had been a gift of affection. And who knows how to, how to make sense of these things. Sully had a kind of checkered career uh, with, uh, with women, especially women um, whose territory he was occupying. I mean, it's another story and it's a very interesting one. The upshot of it was he was transferred and he left that area in the spring of 1857 and nine months later, Mary Sully, um, Akichitawin, soldier woman, uh, was born to Pehan Dutuin. So um, here's Alfred Sully sort of leaving his legacy behind in the upper Missouri territory there at Fort Pierre um, near Pierre, South Dakota today. Now if we go over to the other side of the genealogy, this character Sasue, um, we get a really interesting and different kind of story. The story of Sasue is always told around his vision, um, which is long and extensive. I'm not going to give a full kind of version of it here, but he went and had this vision at a place called the Medicine, Wool, uh, Medicine Knoll up outside of Blunt, South Dakota. Um, and this is a place that has this massive stone kind of uh, sculpture, you know, of a snake. And in fact, in his vision, he, he had dug a pit and he put his head down. His nephew or his cousin, Brown Bear, ran up, rode up to see how he was. He was covered with snakes. And so this, there's snake power, right, that happens in this particular place. Well, in his vision, he entered a teepee and there were two paths on either side of the teepee. And he was told to choose one. On one side were four sweat lodges, on the other side were four skeletons, sort of grinning and making nasty sort of looks at him. Um, he chose the path of the sweat lodge. The birds that were guiding him said, ah, we knew you were gonna choose that. That's your destiny, it's your fate. Um, when he came down off the hill and had his vision interpreted, um, uh, it turns out the men who were interpreting the vision said, well, you're gonna kill four of us, four of your own people. Those sweat lodges mean you'll need to be purified four times. And indeed, over the course of his life, he did kill four uh, of his own people. And in fact, one of the moments when he did one of these killings was a moment when Alfred Sully and Saswe actually met up with one another. It came after the 1862 Dakota resistance in Minnesota, um, uh, which some of you may know, a sort of uh, violent uh, sort of resistance on the part of Dakota people. Um, led to the largest mass execution in American history, the hanging of 38 Dakota people in Mankato. 
Um, after that, though, uh, Alfred Sully was sent out onto the Northern Plains to do what they called sort of cleanup or punitive or mop up kind of operations, which were basically clearing the North Dakota area for white settlement. Uh, and in two places at Whitestone Hill and Kildare Mountain, Alfred Sully attacked Native people to devastating effect. Well, the story in our family is he rode into a camp at one time and he said, a Yankton camp, um, and he said, we know you Yanktons are hiding some of those Santees from over in uh, Minnesota who killed people during that uprising. And uh, if you don't give those people up, you know, we're going to attack you. And that Saswe had at that point volunteered and said, look, you know, I've had a vision where I kill four of our own people. I'm going to kill one of those Santees. Uh, I'm going to give him to Alfred Sully, which is exactly what he did. Drag the body to Alfred Sully of this Santee man uh, and said, here, this is one of those Santees. Now, now get out of here, you know, leave us alone. So these two men meet on either sides of this genealogy, meet in this violent confrontation, but it's one that actually ends up saving Saswe's Yankton people, right? So it becomes um, a kind of, I don't want to say a healing kind of ritual, but a, 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 an interesting and different kind of way of thinking about it. What's really interesting is that the children of these two men actually end up marrying one another. Um, they grew up kind of together in the same area in the Yankton um, Sioux camps. Mary Sully would marry a rancher named John Bordeaux and go and live over on the Rosebud Reservation. Um, John Bordeaux killed by a stray bullet, uh, fired by a bunch of rambunctious cowboys right after he had sold a bunch of his cattle. So he, cattle he was a mixed blood rancher um, there. So she returned to the Yankton Reservation. Philip J. Deloria, on the other hand, T.B. Sapa, had already married um, twice and had two of his wives die, um, two of his wives die. So they, all had, they both had children um, and they came together and formed what we today call a, call a blended family um, together. They also then had uh, three of their own children. Oops, I forgot about this. So they went to the Standing Rock Reservation, which is where my grandfather and my two great aunts were then enrolled. Uh, my uh, great grandfather had the church there at St. Elizabeth's Mission. It was a quite amazing sort of church, a really wonderful place where people, Native people actually did get an interesting kind of education in Dakota and Lakota and English as well. My great grandfather also was a quite noted speaker um, and so went on speaking tours, including to Boston, Philadelphia, and New York City. And in fact, they called him the Indian Phillips Brooks. It was an amazing moment when I first came to the Harvard campus and I saw the vans from the Phillips Brooks house parked out there and I saw kids getting into them and going, I was like, I know Phillips Brooks because he was an oratorical preacher and uh, they named, he sort of made a comparison to my great grandfather to him. And it turns out, of course, Phillips Brooks house is such an important part of, uh, such an important part of Harvard. So here are the three children then of this, uh, this marriage. Uh, and I wanna sort of start by focusing on Ella Deloria, who was a really quite interesting person. She was a linguistic anthropologist. Uh, she went to Oberlin, um, grew up in these reservation schools, went to the boarding school, and All, All Saints boarding school in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and then went to Oberlin. After two years, she transferred to the Teachers College at Columbia um, in New York City where she actually had met up with the uh, American anthropologist Franz Boas. Now he connected up with her a few years later and they ended up working together for the rest of Boas's life and she produced a number of these texts. Some of you may know the, the novel, the ethnographic novel, Water Lily. It's a quite beautiful book, um, told, a story told from Dakota women's uh, perspectives, but she did all kinds of other interesting kind of work. So this is the circle then in which my great aunt from South Dakota was running. It kind of parallels a little bit the experience of my dad, right, in New York City, hanging out with Franz Boas, Ruth Benedict, Margaret Mead, um, as they were developing what was called personality, culture and personality anthropology, a kind of meeting of psychology uh, and uh, anthropology together. And that brought her in contact with this guy, Otto Kleinberg, who developed a project. The first place that Boas put her was with Otto Kleinberg, and he had an idea to develop in race-based intelligence tests. So there would be an African-American test um, that would test intelligence that was culturally indexed to African-American people. The person who was supposed to develop that test was Zora Neale Hurston. Um, and then there was a Native American intelligence test that Ella actually did end up uh, developing. Uh, and then there would be tests that were aimed at rural Appalachian whites and at New York City uh, white people. Um, and the idea was to cross-reference these things and make sort of arguments about cultural relativism as opposed to racial 
um, intelligence. Kleinberg then would later go on to become one of the expert witnesses in the Brown v. Board of Education cases. Um, and so you can see that Ella is herself in the middle of this fantastic and interesting intellectual uh, milieu. She also, however, was in this other kind of interesting place, which was with Campfire Girls. So Ella really struggled to make ends meet. And one of the ways that she did that was to uh, sort of go out and sort of teach Campfire Girls um, about Indian dances and songs, give lectures, um, do these kinds of things. So she was a performing Indian princess, you know, basically. And you can see this image of her on the left side of the screen is her in, you know, her um, regalia. She prepared to go out and do this kind of work, right? Performative intellectual wage labor. Well, one of the places that she went was the Sloat family um, house, one of the two Sloat family houses in the town of Slotesburg, um, New York. It's in Rockland County. Uh, for those of you who know this New York area. Um, so the Sloat family is an entirely different kind of genealogy. It ends up leading to my grandmother there, um, Barbara Sloat Eastburn. Um, Deloria, the Sloat family is one of the more colonial families that you could actually trace, right? They have their own Indian treaty for this land uh, in the Ramapo area around Sloatsburg, um, which I have a copy of and I actually teach in my class. Um, you know, every year we teach this, the, the Deloria family treaty. They're also slave owners. They held uh, five slaves, um, 1790 census. Uh, they dammed up the Ramapo River, created an industrial working class uh, around twine and metal screw manufacture. And they also started the Mexican-American War. So those of you who are in tune with thinking about this, John Drake Sloat, the commander of the Pacific Squadron, sails into Monterey at the beginning uh, of the Mexican-American War. And so there they are, kind of uber-colonial family. How they end up um, with uh, marrying into uh, this native family is a really interesting story, and it concerns um, Ella, who brought the two of them together. So Ella used to tease these girls, these four girls, sisters in the, in the Eastern family. Oh, you should meet my brother. He's a super handsome guy. He's tall, dark, and handsome, and he's a football player. In fact, he was a football player at what is now Bard College, was called St. Stephen's um, back in the day. He was an honorable mention All-American football player, actually in 1922, and he lettered in four sports, all four of his years um, there. And you can see he is a, a very handsome sort of fellow. Um, I wrote an entire book sort of, of uh, essay sort of based on my discovery of him or sort of my coming to awareness of him as a football player. It also makes a great holiday gift called Indians in Unexpected Places. Um, but this is a moment when native people were all over the place, sports, athletics, technology, doing all kinds of interesting things. My grandfather there in the center is a great sort of example of that. And you can see him in the middle picture here in his St. Stephen's uh, football uniform and then later on as a minister. So Ella introduced my grandparents together. Um, you know, she had tried for a long time to get them in the same space and eventually um, she did. She introduced them. Uh, my grandfather went out and stayed at the house in Slotesburg. They drove around Rockland County for three days. He proposed, she accepted. Uh, <laughs> they didn't know each other at all, but he felt like as a clergyman going out back out to South Dakota as a single young man and a very handsome guy, he felt like he had to be married. Um, she had grown up on Campfire Girl uh, sort of stuff, which exoticized Indians. Uh, they were both dedicated to the Episcopal Church, so the union seemed somewhat natural. They went out to South Dakota where my grandmother was basically miserable for the rest of her life, and that's a, another set of stories that are sort of worth us thinking a bit about, although not today. Um, and that brings me then to the very last person on here, um, uh, who is uh, the person I want to talk most about, I think, uh, Susan Mabel Deloria. And I just kind of walk, want to walk you through uh, a bit about her. So out of everyone in the family, she's the one who nobody would have ever thought was going to have any kind of life of significance or achievement. She was chronically shy to the point of actually having what many people in the family described as a kind of psychological disorder or mental health kinds of kinds of disabilities or issues. Um, the daughter of a clergyman, she, she couldn't take communion because she would sort of get so tensed up, she would fall down in the aisle and have something like an epileptic fit, um, you know. And so she didn't venture out in public and she became even more reclusive, you know, over the years. She spent a lot of time up, you know, in her bedroom. So we've thought of her in some sort of ways as kind of Indian artistic Emily Dickinson, right, who sort of just retreated uh, a bit from the world um, to her bedroom. But she did create um, what she called the personality prints, the personality prints project. Um, 
So one of the things that's important about it is she decided to use a different name um, for herself as an artist. She went by Mary Sully, which was her grandmother's name. Um, uh, so, or excuse me, her mother's name. <laughs> ah, am I getting this right? Yes, no. Ah. See, it's confusing. It's everyone in my family is named Barbara Irvine um, and, or, and or Mary Sully. So Mary Sully, Jojo, yes. So she chose her mother's sort of, uh, her mother's name. Um, but mainly she was trying to, I think, sort of uh, cash in on whatever reputational uh, sort of value might have come from the name of Sully, of Thomas Sully, thinking about herself as an American artist. And this is where I think it's really quite interesting and important to think about how she situated herself. But this is kind of what the traditional American Indian arts that were developing in a kind of bicultural context tended to look like um, in the early 20th century. And I've just laid out three different schools, although there's, there's others. They tend to cluster, interestingly, in two different places, in northern New Mexico, uh, around Santa Fe, and uh, in Oklahoma. And these things make a certain amount of sense. There's a lot of tribal people in Oklahoma, um, a lot of schools. Santa Fe was the center of sort of American modernist primitivism, sort of love of Indian kind of art and Indian things um, has a center there. And there's quite a connection right between those two states that uh, is an interesting thing to think about um, and explore. So you notice this is what this art looks like. It's, you know, uh, uh, flat panel kinds of stuff. There's no background, two dimensional, traditional kinds of uh, traditional kinds of themes. So this is the art that Mary Sully started doing. Um, it's on colored pencil, it's a colored pencil on paper. Um, <clears throat> each one is a sort of triptych with three parts. The panels are not quite the same size. The paper is a little uneven. She was operating from a position of poverty um, as an artist. And so um, she ended up uh, sort of reusing her paper, carrying around, I think, this very, very large sheaf of uh, sort of uh, paper that had perhaps been trimmed off of a roll um, elsewhere. Um, so you can see kind of some of the things that she does here. This is um, Amelia Earhart. Each one of these is a person, particular personality. They oftentimes come from popular culture. The top image is almost always a kind of referential or symbolic kind of thing. The middle panel is always a design kind of pattern. And the bottom panel is always this really interesting and complicated thing that looks a little bit like an Indian beadwork um, or quill work kind of pattern, but not quite. Um, and the imagery, I think, is complicated um, here. So you can see with Amelia Earhart, you can see what looks like a plane engine with a propeller. Um, and then perhaps the propeller, we imagine, might be spinning and giving off these kind of triangular sort of shapes. Or the triangular shapes might be something like those Hollywood searchlights, right, that we think of when we think about movies from the 1930s. And in fact, we think, oh, yeah, Amelia Earhart. She flew. She was a pilot. But she loved celebrity. And she loved the limelight, right? Um, and in fact, many, many of the subjects of these things were people who loved celebrity and who saw themselves in the spotlight. Um, here's Lupe Velez, um, uh, film actress. Um, one of the things that's really quite wonderful about these is the odd perspectives that she often adopted. So she, here she is sort of looking kind of from the top down on Lupe Velez's dress, but maybe behind her and catching her shoulders. And so there's an interesting kind of perspective. Again, it turns into a design pattern and then turns into something that might be a bit, little bit more like a quilt, um, quilt pattern full of diamond shapes and stars. So I'm just gonna show you a few of these because if you show one, um, they're quite puzzling. But if you show 10, you start to see the logic of what she's doing, um, how she's making certain kinds of arguments. So here we have Miller Dilling, a harpist, and you can see really clearly the ways that she always links music and color together. And so the color of Mildred Dilling's fingers as she's plucking the harp strings, which are quite visible there, and then color exploding off into the, into the corners. The middle panel turns into one of those glissandi things, right, that happens on a harp. And the bottom panel has a art deco kind of groove to it, right? I mean, it doesn't really look like an Indian beadwork pattern necessarily, so much as in the color and the shape and the form looks like something you might see as a a deco design from the, the 20s or the 30s. Um, she also did figures from the church. Um, so here's um, Bishop Rowe of Alaska. He was a traveling bishop who traveled around lighting the candle of the church in every igloo um, in Alaska. And again, you can see the ways in which those things get transmuted in interesting forms. This is, I think, one of my very, very favorites. Um, she did a lot of stuff that comes out of the plains native women's 
aesthetic tradition around optical illusion. Um, and for a long time, I looked at this and I sort of puzzled over it and thought, well, this is um, kind of a weird humanoid trilobite, you know, kind of in the center of this thing with these yellow, that little bit of yellow in the arms and these two pink eyes and a lot of notes and some hills and maybe there's a blue sky. And so they're, they're a little hard to make sense of. Um, What's really interesting is when you dig into these personalities, you start to discover facts about them, which then make the images become clearer. So it turns out in this case that Lawrence Tibbet um, had a cabin in a little place called Temescal Canyon outside of Los Angeles. And it, the Temescal Canyon had a little amphitheater stage and he would go and stand on the stage and he would sing and the notes would resound out of the canyon. And what you suddenly realize is the thing you had centered as the trilobite is actually the empty space of the canyon with the notes coming out. And the brown at the top is a kind of top of a plateau. And if you locate this in California, you're probably looking past the hills and into the, uh, the ocean as notes sort of ring and resound um, you know, outward. And then curiously in the second panel, you notice that all the themes are visible, but they're upside down as if you were looking through the pinhole of a camera obscura, right? Um, and then turning it into this sort of almost Easter eggy pattern. And then the bottom, a kind of a kaleidoscope, right? Um, kind of thing. So lots of symmetry, um, lots of interesting stuff. I hope you're agreeing with me that she's actually a very interesting artist and a very smart um, and engaged kind of person. Um, this is <clears throat> one of the only three images that she did that actually reflected anything to do with native people. This bishop, um, Bishop William Hobart Hare of the Episcopal Church, was responsible for a lot of different kinds of um, conversions. And what's really interesting to me is the ways in which the figure at the top, this sort of uh, black looming thing, um, functions in three different ways, right? On the one hand, it's a, it's a man. Um, you know, there's arms and there's legs. And you can tell there's legs because it's split at the bottom. On the other hand, it's a cross. I should have started there. It's a cross. And it's about the church, but it's also a man. You can see visible through the spread of legs. And it's also a bird, as you can see through the clipped arms. And in fact, the, what the Lakota people called Bishop Hare was Zikana Dujahan, right? Uh, traveling bird, a swift bird. Um, so she's riffing on his Lakota name and his character as it's expressed through his name, riffing on the cross of the church, right? And riffing on him, right, as a, as a man at the center of the, the circle of the camp. Um, 1938, uh, uh, Ella and uh, Susie put together this list of uh, personality prints. There's 29 of them that were made later, later dates. And you can see stylistic kinds of differences and distinctions. Um, just to give you another little sense of the optical illusion, here's baseball, Dizzy Dean, lots of dizziness visible in that top panel. Um, why put a little lifesaver uh, in the middle of the baseball? But if you let your eye kind of play with the optical illusion, what you see is that the, those background kind of striping things and the stitching on the ball actually creates an optical illusion which the ball wants to come off of the page and at you, right? And so it's almost like being in a Disney 3D kind of, you know, sort of deal. The ball wants to actually move as it would have as it, if it had come off of Dizzy Dean's um, hand. Here's Malcolm Campbell. Um, land speed race driver who had a whole series of super cool cars all called the Bluebird. And all of a sudden you can see an image that made no sense until you understood who Malcolm Campbell was completely comes into focus. Uh, there's a Bluebird with four wheels at the crossing of roads and a speed track and there's driving goggles and all kinds of things. And then the middle panel sort of elaborates that themes and turns it into this kind of Celtic electron of, of speed. Or if you look at this one, Dr. Defoe, a whole series of icons and collections of five then turned into this beautiful, I think, circular pattern. I think this is one of the most beautiful ones that she's done. Makes complete sense when you understand that he's the guy who delivered the Dion quintuplets in 1934. So there's a ton of these beautiful little surprises um, throughout these works and lots of different kinds of visual influences. Here's um, uh, Lakota and Dakota Hyde painting. Here's some of the ethnographic drawing that she actually did for her sister, um, Ella, the anthropologist. Right. Here's an argument um, that I make in the book that she was actually um, engaged with culture and personality anthropology in an intellectual sense. And one way to think about these things is literally as patterns of culture. But she also loved funny pages, right? And you can see the ways that the comics take form, particularly in the ways that she um, is drawing people. She loved film, and in particular, the Busby Berkeley musicals, which you can see sort of laid out here. But she was also engaged with 
modernist artists, right, of the American tradition, in particular Charles DeMuth, who did a whole series of these things. The most famous image, which many of you probably know, I saw the figure five in gold, is a poster portrait, what do you call it, a poster portrait of the poet William Carlos Williams. And you can see this is a fire truck that is racing towards you in the night and the five gets larger and larger as the truck gets closer and closer until literally in the upper right hand corner, the five is occupying the same time and space that you are. So this is the same kind of experiments that she was doing in a visual sort of sense as well. Um, Charles DeMuth and uh, Mary Sully actually did a couple of the same uh, people. Eugene O'Neill was one and uh, Gertrude Stein was another. And you can see the ways in which DeMuth on the left sort of frames Gertrude Stein and where Mary Sully chooses um, Gertrude Stein's sort of very famous phrase, a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose to make the centerpiece right, of, her, uh, you know, of her work. And then I'm gonna show you just, just one more. This is, I think, the sort of keystone to understanding her and maybe understanding how she may be connected up with some of these other folks, right? It's her very explicit sort of um, political kind of thing, placing Indian history in a particular context. And I think one of those contexts is the art context of muralists like Diego Rivera. You can see that in the compartmentalized structure. Um, and the African-American muralist, Aaron Douglas, you can see that in the sort of silhouetted figures of modernist anxiety where she has taken and divided up at the bottom sort of an idyllic pre-contact life the despair of the reservation the modernist anxiety of, of you know and, and i think the aaron douglas riff here is very very um, explicit and the sort of smoggy feet that are literally crushing the aspirations of indian people who would like to rise into a future all this is transmuted into a second panel in which she has no interest in making this into a design Right. Some of these other panels, she tried to sell them as wallpapers or linoleum patterns or things, but this is clearly not that. You can see each one of those bands right, has become part of the new design. And we've added a lot of color to that Indian band. And now in the last one, she flips everything on its side. If you start on the, either the edges, you see the feet, which are crushing you down, framed in, as blue jeans here. You can see the modernist anxiety converted into an, a very abstract figure of brown diamonds the reservation despair converted into the barbed wire of history. But the band that runs down the center, this Indian color, right, overwrites all of that, constructs and imagines a future for native people, which she was engaged in. Um, and she calls this at one point, right, the Luta personality prints. Um, and this is a really important thing. Luta being the color red, um, but also a gesture, not to Thomas Sully and Alfred Sully, but to her own great grandmother, Pehan Lutawin, Pehan Dutawin, Red Crane Woman, and to the practices in Dakota culture of the production of quilled beadwork, um, of honoring, uh, and of red as the color that is associated with those different kinds of things. And so we might think of this as being a project that comes out of Charles de Muth, but it's also a project that comes out of a Dakota kind of epistemological position that you pick out a person and you honor that person, right? And Luta is the word that we might associate with that. And so what she's doing is picking out American figures and making a kind of critical interrogation of them and honoring them, right, through these poster portraits. So um, I've been really uh, fortunate, I think, to work with some of the really wonderful people um, at the uh, uh, Minneapolis Institute of Arts, um, Jill Albert Yo, um, who's uh, been one of the co-curators, and Terry Greaves have been co-curators of uh, this wonderful exhibit, Hearts of Our People, which is down at the Renwick um, in DC right now, not visible or viewable, but um, a fantastic ex uh, exhibition of native women's only arts um, curated by, by women uh, with an advisory committee of all native women. So it's this wonderful kind of reclamation and it's um, been this amazing thing for me to have two of these images um, you know, in that show. It's been also fun to sort of see the ways in which that show or the reclamation of these images at least has sat, um, I think in an interesting kind of dialogue with the Hilma Off Clint show, which was at the Guggenheim, which sort of broke all records at the Guggenheim, you know, a, a year or so ago. Um, the reclamation of a woman engaged in modernist kind of uh, uh, painting kind of practices, which had been here, heretofore um, submerged. So I'm quite happy that I'm also working with some other curators to think a bit about how this show might, if shows actually ever happen again, uh, you know, might uh, make its way out into the world again. And so we're back to the genealogy. And let me just finish off with a few themes and maybe some questions um, to, to think about. So these are all people who cross boundaries, um, native people who cross boundaries and non-native people who cross boundaries, right? Um, uh, 
they married in um, or are they married out? Um, at least two cases, Native people who married out to folks who were actively engaged in the colonial conquest of indigenous peoples. Um, uh, it's also the case that, you know, they moved around a lot. You know, my dad uh, going to New York City and loving the fact that he could go to the lion's head and hang out with these literary types, he was not the first person in this family to do that, right? Ella went and hung out with the anthropologists. Um, Philip J, or the PJ as they called him, went and hung out with the church people, as did my, as did my grandfather. So there's a whole set of interesting kind of movements um, uh, that these folks are making. So in that sense, they were cosmopolitan, really, in the best sense of the word, right? They were taking in influences from the world, crafting new kinds of ideas and practices um, in a really interesting uh, and I think intellectually and aesthetically and politically productive kind of way. At the same time, they were also, each one of them in their own ways and each one evidences in, in their own ways, deeply committed to the Dakota, Lakota tribal heritage, right? And to the politics of Indian autonomy and self-determination. But right? in that sense, they were not assimilated people, right? They were cosmopolitan people who thought in these really interesting kind of ways, but always maintained their commitments and their connections, right, to Indian country. They also then, I think it's interesting, worked out um, this combination in a range of professions that were important within the American context and arguably important within native context as well. That ranged from diplomacy on the one hand, um, the church, um, the church is a obviously pervasive theme throughout here, um, art, anthropology, law. My dad became a lawyer, my uncle, very famous for training tons and tons of native people um, in the law, um, the academy. Um, so they went into institutional kinds of settings in which they could do this kind of work. And so the question I've been pondering and sort of maybe just to return, ask you to think about at the beginning is, how do you make sense of a family like this, right? And how do you make sense of these curious kind of continuities, right? Is the work of, of, of Susie or Mary Sully, um, which is very much like what Thomas Sully did, painting portraits of celebrities, right, in his particular moment, right? Is, a, is this a connection? Uh, is it a, a sort of pillaging? Is it a, you know, how do we make sense of what that's like? Should we think of a family like this as being greater or less than the sum of its parts, right? So is a family just about a lot of cultural transmission, right, of a lot of parents teaching their kids in certain kinds of ways? Or um, as Saswe would have said, and my dad would have said, um, is there a certain mystical destiny? Part of one of Saswe's visions, at least as my dad recounted it, was that he was committing four or perhaps seven generations of his family to doing this kind of intercultural work. And so was there a spiritual aspect um, you know, to this? Or alternatively, is this family just not that exceptional, right? If you took any number of families and dug into them in great detail, would you find something similar? Am I just lucky in having a whole rich genealogy sort of um, available? I'll have to say like both my father and I have done a lot of work um, and my mom as well in terms of sort of reconstructing that, right? Or is this family somehow uniquely positioned in relation to Dakota and indigenous and American history? So how do you make sense of, of this kind of continuity and similarity um, across, uh, across time? And I believe I have, pulled in with 15 minutes left. Heather, are you okay? More or less uh, about right? So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen at this point. Um, and uh, I think we've got some time for questions and, um, and conversations. Professor Deloria, thank you so, so much. That was absolutely fantastic. And it's, it just feels so good right now to be immersed in storytelling and art and history. So thank you very, very much. Um, so we're going to invite questions from the audience. And um, I am seeing that Fred has a question. So Fred, if you would unmute yourself, then please uh, go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a somewhat personal question that I would never have thought of had we been two weeks ago in the Charles Hotel ballroom. But I sit this morning in central Colorado on land that's been associated with my family since about 1905, before they arrived as homesteaders, and there were some miners here before that, um, we know that there were Utes here for some period of time, uh, just down the hill from where I am right now. And we know they must have been there for some time because of the hundreds of arrowheads that my uncles picked up as boys 90 years ago. 
So my question is, how might I go about figuring out exactly when they came and when they left? You know, there's um, <clears throat> one of the things that was going to be kind of cool about um, our alumni trip was we were actually going to go to Southern Ute. And, um, and one of the things that's on the website is, um, as I recall, a kind of a nice, fairly recent history of, um, you know, of Ute people. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of different kind of ways into, you know, into these histories. Um, you know, I mean, I would start with simply the secondary kind of literature about, um, you know, about you people. But I think that also leads you, can lead you quite quickly into thinking more about how you might do some more interesting kind of primary source research. And the first place I always recommend people to go is to find the treaties that have to do with the particular land on which, they, um, on which they're situated. There's two really great resources for this. One is, and I'm not gonna remember this, but it's, uh, it's basically, it comes out of Canada. It's the in sort of indigenous territories map. And it, if you Google this, it, it usually comes right up. You can kind of zoom in um, and, uh, and look at the particular place you're at and see the sort of tribal affiliations. But an even better site is the site that's put together by Claudio Sant. Um, I think he put it together for his book, West of the Revolution. Uh, and so if you Google Claudio Sant, um, native land maps, one of the things you can see is this incredible kind of moving map that sort of shows different forms of land dispossession all across the continent. You can actually zoom in and you can uh, go and look at the specific treaty um, that had to do with your uh, particular, um, you know, region. Now, how precise you can get uh, with that um, on those sources, you know, it, you, you can't get super precise, but I'll give you one last sort of thing and then turn to the next question, which is a really powerful article, um, uh, piece of scholarship, scholarly and journalistic writing um, in High Country News by um, Bobby Lee, um, Robert Lee, who's a Harvard Society Fellows um, fellow, and Tristan Atone, a really wonderful native journalist, uh, about native land grants um, under the Moral Act. Act, or let me say this better, um, the Morrill Act land grants. Um, and what they did was assemble the database that has 185,000 um, entries in it, basically tracking every parcel of land that shows up in the Morrill Land Act um, uh, sort of land claims that universities made, right, which funded many of these universities and tracing them back to the actual native peoples um, who were uh, dispossessed of that, of that land. So it's an extraordinary piece of scholarship. And taking those three things together, I think you could model a kind of a project to figure out uh, much more precisely sort of where you are situated in, in your space. Great. Uh, spelling of Sant, please. S-A-U-N-T. Great, thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Fred. So um, I see that in the chat that we have a question from Eve. Um, Eve, I can either read your question or if you want to unmute yourself and, and ask it directly, um, entirely your preference. All right, looks like Eve is not unmuting herself, so I'll read her question. Um, she's asking about the difference between Lakota and Dakota. Mm. Um, what is the difference between those two terms and what are the correct usages? Uh, and she also expresses her thanks for being with us today. Thank, thank you, Eve. Um, and I, I just put my comments up, you know, as well. And thanks to Roni, Tro, Rowena and Emily as well. Thank, thank you. It's so wonderful of you. So um, Lakota and Dakota are um, basically dialectical differences of the same language. And many people would say there's actually Nakota as well. And so you heard me rotating or alternating between Pehan Dutawin and Pehan Lutawin. Right, and so uh, Lakota, um, we would use an L, and Dakota, we would use a D, and those two things would basically replace each other. So Pehan Lutowin and Lakota, Pehan Dutowin, Pehan Nutowin, perhaps in, in Nakota, which has more of a northern, um, northerly kind of uh, kind of location, you know, to it. So um, so those are the differences. There there are dialectical differences. Um, places are interesting though. Standing Rock, for example, has both L speakers and D speakers. So when Ella grew up at, at Standing Rock and my grandfather and my other great aunt, you know, as well, they were kind of interestingly fluid in moving back and forth between the two. And you can tell the differences are not that huge. Many, many people can, you know, can kind of hear and, and move across the, the languages. If you're interested in, in exploring this more, the uh, Lakota Language Consortium has a really wonderful phone app, which I've been doing in isolation as I ride the exercise bike. Um, you know, uh, sort of just doing the Lakota language uh, kind of thing. I can, I can uh, name all kinds of colors and many animals um, <laughs> at this point. 
Wonderful, thank you. Um, so uh, a question that was actually um, submitted in advance of the program. Uh, one of our participants was curious, uh, Professor Deloria, to hear about your experience um, coming onto Harvard campus um, and what that experience was like, one as a professor and as a teacher, but also um, as a person of Native American descent and how did you feel welcome within the community um, and what that experience was like for you? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, like uh, Harvard did did roll out the red carpet for me, you know, in, in many, many ways, right? So, um, you know, uh, uh, many colleagues reached out, of course, the history department has been, you know, been fabulous. Um, you know, uh, wonderfully, one of the things that Harvard did, you know, I, I came in January of 2018, and within a month or two, we were engaged in a major initiative to hire um, Joe Gaughan and Tanya Miles, my co former colleagues at Michigan, uh, who are major, major scholars um, in Native Americans. In fact, Joe is doing um, something for Radcliffe right now on Native American health on reservations. And so I recommend if you go on the Radcliffe site and, and, and uh, you know, many times those things are saved and recorded and take a look at what Joe's talking about. He's a clinical psychologist um, who does really wonderful work. And Taya Miles does incredible work on sort of Afro-Native kinds of relations. Also at the same time, Harvard hired um, Shawan Kinu in the Department of Art History. Um, and so we went from basically sort of not much of a presence to having you know, a real anchoring presence. And I think one of the things that was really useful and important about that was the ways in which it also made visible the very, very good work that had been going on here for a very long time. Um, so with the Harvard University Native American program, Shelley Lowe, who I think is perhaps on um, you know, with us today, um, you know, who has done great work in terms of sort of Harvard's native community and kind of pulling it together and developing it, but also revealed many, many other people on campus. Ann Browdy in the Div School, David Carrasco in the Div School in Anthropology, uh, Matt Liebman uh, in uh, Anthropology, Joe Singer in the Law School. Uh, you know, it's, the list goes on, right? I mean, we actually have 10 or 12 people who are engaged in native studies. Um, Dan Carpenter in government. Um, so, uh, so I, it's been really kind of interesting and fun in that way to sort of think about, uh, think about this. Because Harvard is a private um, and because I was an academic administrator in a public institution, I have to say the mysteries of Harvard are mysterious. You know, they are mysterious. And I am oftentimes quite befuddled. Um, you know, I'm used to being in a place where you knew what your tuition dollar counted for in terms of a, a, a butt in a seat. That was a calculation that we made and you could figure stuff out accordingly. Harvard's a little more mysterious, you know, I think, um, in that regard. But I should say, my first grad seminar here, I had more Native and Indigenous students than I've ever had in any class I've ever taught in the course of my career, including um, Aboriginal folks from Australia, um, people who were doing Sami work uh, in Scandinavia, um, a whole series of Native students, um, many Harvard, but also folks who were coming up from Brown or coming over from BU. Um, and my undergraduate teaching has just been, uh, a, you know, kind of a delight, really. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's been great. It's been really good. Wonderful. So um, I'll do a last call to our audience here if anybody um, would like to either drop a message in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and I also have an additional question um, from the pre-submitted questions, um, and which I think is a really interesting tie. Um, to um, the work of our HA board this year. There was an initiative entirely working on um, storytelling. So one of the questions that was pre-submitted was, um, how would you address uh, storytelling traditions? Uh, do you consider them as sacred te texts within American Indian religions? Uh, that's a really great question. So, you know, there's some stories that are um, not for public consumption, right? There are stories that have seasonal kind of dimensions, right? Storytelling many, many Native communities, right, is a winter activity. Um, you hunker down for the winter and you tell stories, right? And, and you know, I think that a lot of times, right, uh, sort of Native epistemological positions are framed as, you know, well, they are not part of a linear Western rational kind of thing. They're part of a cyclical kind of thing. Storytelling is the, is the in Native traditions, is the most intellectual work, right? I mean, it's not like you sit around and tell a story and listen to it. Right? You tell the story, there are commentary attached to it, there is questions of the story, the story is a basis for philosophical kind of investigation. The figures, um, I haven't actually published this, but a while back I wrote a piece about sort of um, the figure of the um, wink tea, the sort of cross-dressing, gender con confounding person, the hayoka, the person who does everything backwards, um, 
uh, the trickster figure, Iktomi, um, you know, these are philosophical positions that um, open up into infinite kind of um, thought and investigation. And so storytelling is in many, many ways um, a spur to collective thought and conversation and the development of native intellectual kinds of thoughts and, and traditions. Um, then there's other stories though, which are, are sacred stories and, and important stories that are just you know, meant to be told to certain peoples at certain, certain kinds of times. And there's stories that move in and out of certain kinds of circuits. You know? So my grandfather, who was a really, really great storyteller, knew, um, uh, learned all the stories from Standing Rock and was as a missionary, um, was at Pine Ridge and was at Rosebud, um, you know, came from Yankton. Um, so he had traditions from the lower part of the river, the upper part of the Missouri River, and the, the kind of western part. He could tell stories for hours and hours and hours and hours. You know, some of those were stories that had once been private stories, you know, 100 years ago, but had become public stories, you know, and songs, um, you know, in the intervening period of time. So, you know, the storytelling tradition is, is super important. Um, I think it's... Uh, it's not easily captured, you know? I mean, it's not easily sort of essentialized down into a couple of things. It is a really, really complicated thing. And I th think of it, you know, in terms of sort of the way I think about native and indigenous science, um, you know, which is a category. I'm gonna say one more thing, Heather, and then I'm gonna stop, right? Cause I don't wanna, I can get going. You can tell I can get amped up on this stuff, but you know, I mean, native intellectual work gets put into Western kinds of contexts like religion. Uh, oh, it's spirit native spirituality, and it's kind of like religion, but it's not actually. It's it's more complicated than that. Or science, right? There's a oh, and they don't really do science, or they kind of do. But actually, this is a this is, these are people who are on the land, intimately for very very long periods of time, right? Who do what the rest of people do, right? Scientists, which is observe things, make deductions, speculations, hypothesis, investigate, experiment, right? Figure stuff out communicate it to the next generation. It sounds a lot like science to me, frankly, right? Um, but you might think of it as spirituality as well. It's knowledge production that takes place. Um, these are smart, smart people, um, you know, traditionally and historically. They are smart, smart people um, today um, as they navigate the politics of tribal reservations and their own sovereignty. Um, you know, so it's really easy for us to sort of like miss, I think, the complexities of this. Um, so I want to thank you for the question, right? Because storytelling is uh, a fundamentally important and fundamentally mysterious and fundamentally productive thing that happens in Native communities. Wonderful. Well, we're just about out of time. So um, Professor Deloria, I just want to say thank you so much on behalf of the alumni community for uh, being so generous with your time uh, and with your history and with your family. Um, and such a beautiful, amazing art um, as well. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, I will um, say to our um, participants, um, we'll be sending out an email in the next day or so, um, sharing some additional um, resources uh, for reading and connecting. Um, and uh, we'll also include in that a survey, uh, which we always ask for your feedback. Um, but it's just so great to see so many folks gathered here today. Um, and thank you all again for joining us. And thank you again, Professor Deloria. It's been my pleasure. Thanks to everybody. Stay safe, um, stay healthy.